General McChrystal, greetings and great to see you on First Western. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on this morning. I would like to start with a recent article of the Washington Post. The Washington Post reports that U.S. President Joe Biden is ready to cross Putin's red lines regarding the security assistance for Ukraine. Does the U.S. Uh, no longer fear Russian escalation? Well, I can't speak for President Biden or the United States government, but my sense is that most Americans believe that the importance of stopping Vladimir Putin from what he is doing in Ukraine and, of course, more broadly in Europe is important enough that we've got to do whatever it takes to stop that action. Also, I would like to cover current situation in the war in Ukraine. How could you describe the current phase of the war uh, in Ukraine from a military point of view? Every soldier is humble about their ability to assess things on the ground when I am not personally there. But my assessment from afar is that the effectiveness of Ukraine's first defense and then counter offensives against Russia have changed the dynamic on the battlefield. There is a sense inside Ukraine and also a sense around the world that Russia is likely to lose. And because wars are won in the minds of people much more than they are in actual actions on the battlefield, the morale of Ukraine's forces, relative weakness of the Russians, even though they are learning lessons on the battlefield, is critical. I would like to believe that this summer will be decisive, but I believe that it is, if it's not decisive, that Ukraine's resolve and hopefully the support of the West will make it decisive in the long run. Is there any weapon or technology which could be a game changer for the upcoming counteroffensive operation? I don't think there's a single weapon. If, if you talk massive weapons like ATACMs, which will go extended range across the border, or other kinds of aircraft, I mean, theoretically, there are things that would change the dynamic, but of course, the risk of nuclear war goes up in that case. I think what it really is going to be the difference will be twofold. First will be the use of precision weapons, as have been used, drones supporting uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, then precision strike weapons. And the F-16s, when finally fielded, will add an additional ability to reach back and hit point targets. So I think those things will make the difference. Also, U.S. finally agreed to provide us with F-16, but unfortunately they will not participate in the upcoming counteroffensive operation. Is it even possible to conduct a successful counteroffensive without modern fighter jets? I hope that it is. And we, of course, will find out. I think that when I look at the defenses that Russia has put in place, they look very much like the first or the second world war, deep belts of anti-tank and other kinds of defenses. So Russia is counting on having a grinding fight on the battlefield. I would like to believe that the ability to locate things like supply dumps, command and control headquarters, and other key nodes behind the front lines that can be then targeted will make the difference. F-16s would be very helpful, but as you said, they won't be available for this summer. And so it'll have to be done with existing weapon systems. You mentioned about Russian defense system. Russia has built a system of trenches in all occupied territories. What is the best way from a military point of view? What is the best way to deal with such uh, defensive system trenches during the counteroffensive? Traditionally, if you try frontal attacks on prepared defensive systems like trenches, which are done in depth, they're not a single line, but they're very many kilometers deep. If you fight broadly, you fight all of them. So the most effective way is twofold. First is to take narrow, uh, get, create narrow gaps in the defense get to the rear and then expand there where the defenses, those fixed defenses, then become irrelevant. 
or of course try to go around it. And of course, the, the goal of an enemy is to create an unbroken line. So I think what Ukraine is going to have to do is look for certain places where it can create gaps, it can create openings, go in and then move. Once it does that, and in what they call turns or unhinges the Russian defensive lines, at least for the last two years, the Russians have not shown enough battlefield flexibility and agility to be able to maneuver quickly. So they could be very vulnerable because they have locked themselves into these defensive positions. Uh, also, are Western tanks critically important for such uh, movements on the ground? They are. Now, tanks are uniquely vulnerable on the modern battlefield, as we've seen with the Javelin and other weapons against Russian tanks. So, in fact, tanks are not a panacea or a solution to all problems. But once you can create a gap through minefields and defensive systems and the tanks can get in the enemy rear, they're very difficult for the enemy to deal with. And the speed at which they move and the firepower they bring and just the shock effect on enemy forces is considerable. And I would argue that if Ukrainians can create that kind of opening and exploit it with tanks, that the Russian forces, to me, appear vulnerable to that. Also, oh, Ukraine will receive German tanks, will, issue, will receive British tanks, but uh, don't you think that U.S. could contribute for Ukraine more Abrams tanks? Of course, one of the challenges with the Abrams is it was designed for a slightly different kind of war, so it's a complex machine and it uses a lot of fuel. But if you ask my personal opinion, it's yes. I, my personal opinion as an American citizen, I wish we would give more M1s to Ukraine because I believe that having a critical mass number gives you the opportunity to create the kind of onslaught that's very difficult for the Russians to deal with. If they can, if Ukraine is limited to a smaller number of tanks and then the enemy can attrit part of that force, it's harder to maintain momentum. So I personally would advocate for more, but you know, I'm not in the government right now. But what is the reason of such hesitation to provide us with more Abrams tanks? Are such uh, reasons a military, technical or political one? I really can't speak to it. I, you could argue that there may, not, there may be limitations on the number of tanks available. There also could be concerns about just tipping the balance in the war. But, I, but I'm not in the halls of power to give you that insight. Also, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says that upcoming Ukrainian counteroffensive operation will be a successful one. In your opinion, how could such success look like on the ground? I think we talked earlier a little bit about the battle being decided in the minds of men. I think Russia's army has had serious reverses. If we look before the war in January, a year and a half ago, Everyone expected the Russians to succeed very, very quickly. And, and then when they launched the special operations, I think most of us, and I'm quite honest, I admit, I expected them to succeed quickly. But they showed extraordinary uh, vulnerabilities in their military, their command and control. And then, of course, Ukraine's military showed tremendous effectiveness and resolve. I think that's in the minds of Russian forces right now. If they believe that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is likely to be lethal to them personally, but also effective on the ground, it's very difficult for them to maintain a co cohesive defense. And if we look at they've, they've had to change commanders out numerous times in the war. So I don't think Russian confidence is high. In fact, I would argue that the trench lines almost reflect that. They are trying to, do, to stop an onslaught that they are scared of. And so I think once the Ukrainians can achieve some kind of clear successes, it's likely that that momentum will increase. I can't guarantee that, but I just sense that Russia has tremendous brittleness in their force. Also, former U.S. general and former CIA director David Petraeus says that, says that successful Ukrainian counteroffensive operation could force Russia to participate in negotiations. Do you support such point and do you think that it is even possible to achieve just peace with Russia by negotiations? I want to believe that. 
And uh, General Petraeus is, of course, a brilliant man. And, and I think that success in a counteroffensive will put pressure on the Russians to do that. But that's assuming that the leadership in Russia is rational and willing to make that kind of calculation. I'm not sure that Vladimir Putin is that person. Now, that doesn't mean that he necessarily remains in power. If in fact there's a successful offensive, there will be pressure inside Russia to reach some kind of negotiated settlement to stop the fight. Whether that includes increasing pressure on Putin or not is impossible to say, but I think it's likely. Also, how could you assess the conflict between Russian Evgeny Prigozhin Wagnerians and Russian Russian army? Uh, some moments, some moments of friendly fire also have been reported through the between the Russian army and Russian Wagnerians. Just think about the vulnerability of that. This is two parts of the same military force. And they have a different command structure. They are arguing about ammunition and logistics. They are uh, arguing in the press about leadership and things like that. So clearly there's a lack of trust. When stress hits on the battlefield, those kinds of relationships become very, very vulnerable. Napoleon once said that if he could fight against any enemy, he would like it to be a coalition. What he means is a group of different entities. Inside the Russian army now, they have the weakness of a coalition. It's like having two separate armies, and that's tough to stay cohesive on the battlefield. And I would argue that could turn out to be one of their biggest weaknesses. Do you believe that it's a true argue between Russian army and uh, Russian Wagnerians? Don't you think that it, it could be a planned, a planned argue? I don't know why they do that. Because I think what they try to portray to the world is a unified, strong front. And by showing the frictions between the two, I think they just create a uh, perception of weakness. So from my standpoint, it, there's no advantage to doing that. If they were trying to lure the world into thinking they're weaker than they are and then surprise Ukraine with a counteroffensive, this isn't the way to do it, in my view. Also, I'd like to cover drone attack on Moscow and on um, mo many Russian cities. How could they uh, influence Russian ability to continue its aggression and to continue to mobilize people inside Russia? I think it's a two-edged sword. And what I mean by that, on the one hand, if you attack inside Moscow or anything inside uh, Russia or its closest allies, you create this idea that we are being assaulted and there's a natural tendency for a nation to unite when assaulted. On the other hand, if we go back to the experience near the beginning of the Second World War, after Pearl Harbor, when the United States launched aircraft, off the aircraft carriers and bombed Tokyo, it didn't have military effect, but it had huge psychological effect. The same thing happened when Britain bombed Berlin early in the Second World War. And so what it does is it just puts on notice everyone in that country that war is real. It's not just something they see on television or in newspapers. In fact, war can come to their city, to their neighborhood, to their lives. And by doing that, I think you, you plant a seed, particularly for a nation like Russia, which has known the brutality of war to such a huge extent uh, two generations ago. I think that will be uh, something that reminds them of the realism and the danger of this. So you believe that such drone attacks are clever movements which could lead to a victory in the war? They, as, as two-edged swords, there's an argument that they make it worse, but I would argue they also bring things home to people. So Kiev is being hit on a regular basis. Civilian targets are being hit on a regular basis. Russia is doing that. Have Russia struck, to me, is a good reminder both to Russia and to the world that war, once you enter into a war, you are vulnerable to people doing the same to you that you do to them. Also, new participant of the war has popped up. Free Russia legions, Russian partisans continue to conduct raids and attacks on Russian soil, on uh, 
uh, Belgorod region. Are such attacks helpful for, for Ukraine from a military point of view? I think it's hard to argue that those attacks are big enough to be significant militarily. But psychologically, I think they're very powerful. If we go back to the Second World War, the effectiveness of Soviet partisans but behind German lines was significant. And they create, again, a reminder inside Russia that anything that happens on the battlefield in Ukraine can happen inside Russia as well. And so I think that the psychological effect is really where their value lies. Also, the Time reports that Free Russia Legion recruits more soldiers and even plans to attack Moscow. Um, would it be possible for them to attack Moscow and could it lead to regime change in Russia? I, I can't judge that movement well enough to know whether militarily they can do that. They wouldn't have to do much, um, if you think about it, effective cyber attacks or terrorist-like attacks. Anything like that that makes Russia feel less secure is going to make many Russians stop and think, what are we doing? Is this worth it? Uh, look back at what Chechnyans did uh, during the troubles there inside Russia itself. So anything that brings war home makes people recalculate their commitment to it. Also, top U.S. General Mark Milley says that the U.S. does not support any attack on, Russia, on Russian soil uh, from Ukraine. Don't you think that it would be fair to support such Ukrainian initiatives because Russia, Russia does such attacks? I think it's a question of whether Americans emotionally support the attacks or physically and militarily support them. I can see why the United States government does not physically or militarily support those attacks, because in the, uh, in the comments of Putin and the attitude of his government, that would increase perception of American direct involvement in the war. And that would give him an argument to say that we are fighting against the United States and therefore we need to widen that war. So I think it is natural for the United States officially not to support those because officially what we are doing is helping Ukraine defend itself. And that's a very clear task. That, that is very clearly not trying to widen the war. But I think emotionally there are many Americans that see strikes inside Russia by Ukrainians or by Russians inside Ukraine or Russia as being an expected and reasonable response to things on the ground inside Ukraine. Don't you think that any possible Ukrainian movement through Russian soil could help us to, um, to have a successful counteroffensive and to destroy Russian troops inside Ukraine? It's a difficult calculation. If we go back to the American involvement in Korea in the early 1950s, of course, just north of North Korea, communist China had a huge staging area and forces. And there was a lot of discussion. Should we bomb north of the Yalu River? Should we have forces go there so we could prevent them from having a safe haven there? And military arguments can say, yes, we should do that. On the other hand, once you cross an international border like that, you change the nature of the fight. Ukraine has many people, many nations around the world that support it that I think might be weaker in their support if they felt that Ukraine had invaded inside Russia, even if it was a military movement to help defend Ukrainian uh, territory. It changes the narrative of the war. And as we talked at the beginning of this, in many ways, this war is going to be won as much in its narrative as it will on the battlefield. But could it be helpful just from a military point of view? Well, just from a military point of view, you could argue yes, but really effective generals have got to understand there's nothing that is just from a military point of view. Everything that the military does affects the attitudes of populations, the minds of politicians and diplomats. So if you just try to look at military things in isolation, 
And I think you make a big mistake because wars are not fought in isolation. They are fought in the wider context of the environment. Oh, so my last question for you. Recently, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says that the U.S. will help Ukraine to build army of the future. How should such Ukrainian army of the future look like to deter Russia from possible future aggression, in your opinion? Yeah, in my personal opinion, you are evolving to that right now. First is there has to be a certain component of just sheer military power, artillery pieces, tanks, very well-trained conventional forces. But then the real strength of Ukraine has been its adaptability. If you think about how quickly Ukraine has learned to use new technology, to develop new tactics on the battlefield to deal with a numerically superior foe, the use of drones, the use of very well-connected firing artillery and rocket systems that are targeted by drones and supported by outside intelligence collection. I think that's going to be Ukraine's secret. Ukraine is going to have to develop a technologically advanced and very agile force that can deal, because I don't think Russia is going to have that for a while. They will move in that direction. But I think that will be should be the differentiation that Ukraine seeks to reinforce. You mentioned about uh, developments in the Ukrainian army. Uh, do you personally support Ukraine's membership in NATO, maybe after the end of the war? There was a time when I worried that it would be provocative to Russia. And there is still an argument that if Russia has Ukraine as a member of NATO on its border, that it would be something that will guarantee a future conflict. I'm not sure about that anymore. I am, I am moving my attitude now where I, where I think that Ukraine being a member of NATO may well be the best thing for Ukraine, may be the best thing for NATO. And as Russia comes to accept that, the best thing for Russia as well. Thank you, General, for your time and for participation in the interview and uh, glory to Ukraine. Thank you very much and good luck with all you're doing.